Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Sutton. Um, first off, thanks to you and Ruby for putting this together and for doing it and being here as well. Um, my name is Carolyn Sutton, I think I already said that. Uh, my, the title of my exhibition is Which is in Word, Not Deed. It's currently at the Edinburgh Central Library on George IV Bridge. It'll be there through next week, Thursday. It's been there. Oh. Just, in, just in case people can't hear. <laughs> Is that better? All right, so it's been there since the end of September. It's running through the 30th of November, which is next week, Thursday. Um, and in its current iteration, there are 13 dresses um, remembering 13 women that were accused of witchcraft under the Witchcraft Act of 1563 here in Scotland. Um, I've made the dresses as historically accurate as I can manage. Um, and imprinted on each of the dresses are words that were used against the women in some form, words that condemned them. Um, different forms are um, confession, pardon me, air quotes, but confessions, um, the details, the actual accusations themselves, um, folklore folk tales. Um, some, some women, we have very little information, and so there's, um, you know, I've tried to kind of scrape together as much as I can. Um, so you'll see those on all the different dresses. They're also, um, they're worn by, by empty forms, um, really with the hopes of trying to get across the idea of the, the loss of identity and the loss of women, um, which the witch trials resulted. Um, there are also booklets that contain all the texts, the original texts that are on the dresses, um, interpretation panels for each of the women, and um, an intro and an exit panel as well, kind of talk about the project in general and some of the research and how the research is. Um, and then there's also a remembrance book um, where I've asked people to leave, um, leave their thoughts or anything they'd like to say about, about the women, about the witch trials, about what they thought of the exhibition, any of that. Um, and really, it's become sort of a movable memorial to the victims of the witch trials. So my background, um, this was actually my major project for my MFA in Heritage and Exhibition Design, but I also have an MLIS, Library of Information Science and Archival Administration degree. And my background before that was mostly in art, so studio art and photography. Um, I wanted to do something for years, but it really just took this sort of combination of skills and, and backgrounds, and it was just the right timing for, for something to come together like this. Um, I think people sometimes ask me where my interest came from. It's, it's a tough question to answer for me, but I, I think the, the best I can figure is that it might have come from my love of fairy tales and folklore, so all the stories we were told as kids. And then I was fascinated by, by all the characters, but then as adults, you start to learn the actual history and you connect the dots and you think, wow, these are real people. And so it's sort of in, in the hopes of looking at social justice and critical and difficult heritage um, and feminism as well, um, that was, I think, how this was born. Um, I was really thinking about how we can remember them and how to tell their true stories. Um, and also talk a little bit about the bigger history. Obviously, that's a huge topic. Um, and I can only do a little bit in, in this exhibition, but I've done my best. I also kind of wanted to give them a little bit of their voice back as much as I could. Um, so I, I tried to think about loss in a physical form, which was a difficult um, problem to try to navigate. Uh, but I wanted a way for people to be able to interact and connect with them, and it, it needed there needed to be a presence of some sort. So. In order to remember them as people and bypass all those problematic representations that we come across so often and not dip into that dark tourism and that witch tourism stuff. Um, I thought about something that was sort of mundane and everyday, something every day in their everyday life. And so the idea of clothing uh, came to mind. So the dresses are all really personalized. They're all very different. Um, and I considered things like where they lived, when, you know, what they did, uh, the time periods they lived in, you know, what their financial status was like, just what their everyday lives might have been like. And I tried to actually make something that they might have worn or might have chosen to wear. Um, so, for example, um, one of the women was a housemate. So I've made um, her dress has detachable sleeves because I just imagined she might take those off when she was cleaning and roll up the, the sleeves of her shift sort of thing. There was another woman who was accused of um, dancing with the devil. So she was out um, drinking with, she was a, a widow, middle-aged widow. She was out um, drinking and dancing with her friends, other widows. And so I made a dress um, 
that had this train that could be hiked up and attached just to made her a dress to dance and that sort of thing. So I did try to think about those things. So the process really, uh, I started just looking at loads of resources, um, which is when I came across Julian's amazing work and the, the survey, which is incredibly helpful. Um, I was looking at specific areas, different kinds of stories, and what information was available on their cases. And I really wanted to choose a variety, you know, just sort of a cross section of all the different things. Um, there's no way to do all the different things, but various different walks of life, ways accusations came across, what happened after. There, there's specific situations. So I just I tried to to really um, tell as much of the bigger story as I could through these individual stories. Um, but it was really, really, really difficult to choose. It might be the the hardest part for us to choose. Um, but once I did. Um, I would do just to, you know, do that deep dive research. So really looking at primary sources when I could, spending lots of time in archives and libraries around around Scotland and England and wherever I could find the records. I tried really hard to find original records that, you know, the Kirk Session records and those sorts of things, because there was something about being happy and having the record that, you know, people were writing as they were in the room that sealed their fate kind of thing. And it just, it, it sort of helped me. I don't know, connect connect to them in a different way. Um, but a lot of times there was none of that. Um, and we'd have to I'd have to find secondary sources or just transcriptions. There are some amazing transcriptions that are out there that have been done through the years. So that was really helpful too. Um, so then once I had the words that I decided that and I also tried to think about different um different stories I could tell through the you know, through the through the texts. So besides the ones I mentioned, there's also, you know, propaganda pamphlet news from Scotland. So I thought that was important to show there was propaganda out there as well. Um, one is on that there's a report of their murder. So they were lynched and there was this actual report of their murder. So I tried to have, again, a wide variety of things, show as much as I could and a, a little space. So once I had all of that, I would create one gigantic document with it. So I would use it, I would use the words to fill up all of the fabric I would need for the dress. So typically it was about 54 inches wide and four to six meters long, sometimes longer. And I would take, I would transcribe all that text, put it into this document and lay it out on this one piece of fabric because I thought it was important to have that whole story from which to cut. So that, um, that was another thing I, you know, another part of that process that felt important to me. Um, I would also research the style of the dress, which was really difficult. So there's not a lot of information out there. There's much more information about what men wore in Scotland, especially during that time. And even the, the experts that I reached out to, they'd say, you know, we've seen a background character in a painting from that era. That's kind of the best information we have, you know, or I did find a couple of, um, there were a couple of companies who put out patterns or ideas for what clothing might have looked like in those areas. So kind of reproduction places. So I would start with those and then kind of alter them down to what I thought might work for them. Um, then I would have that whole piece of fabric laid out and put the pattern pieces on in a way that I thought relevant text would be especially visible. So, um, and again, there's a variety of ways that worked out. Some of them it's, you know, you start on one side. So an air safe, for example, starts on one side, goes up and over. Um, other people, you know, the when they were condemned to, you know, their execution, it's right in the, you know, right in the front. So I tried to really be aware of that. Um, and then sewing, which was, interestingly, usually the easiest part of the whole process. And um, I'd also make the sh the shifts, the undergarments, capelets, other, you know, bits and pieces that I thought would work for that. And make the forms out of the really simple forms. I'd really love to update those at some point, but at least they're working for now, um, just out of chicken wire. So these were all new things I had to try to figure out how to do um, and support them. And there's a light inside them as well. Um, and then I would make the panels, the interpret interpretation panels. And that was really difficult because sometimes there were loads of, you know, there's there were loads of resources from which I could pull and try to gather stuff. Other times there was very little. So again, trying to tell as much as I could about, about each woman and their backgrounds, what happened with them. Um, each of them has a wooden sign with their name, their place of residence, their birth and death dates, if we have them, and their fates, if we have them. A lot of these, again, we don't. We don't. Um, there are also embroidery hoops that have um, sort of themes throughout, and another one with a map with a red pin on it, marking where they lived. 
there are other elements that aren't at the library that were in the major, well, in the degree show, um, which were some sound recordings that uh, Rowan Morrison had done. She's part of the Scottish Storytelling Centre and she's someone I've collaborated with a few times. And then I also had an interactive table with the prompt, I am here because, um, asking people to write on a scrap of the same linen cloth reasons why they think they might have fallen into the same situations as the woman who were accused. Um, we talked a lot about social media, and there were some really amazing conversations that came out of that. Um, I've also done some public engagement, some community engagement, and I started a public consultation about the National Memorial. I'm hoping to get some future funding and tour around. I have some more ideas of other things I'd like to do, plus I'd like to just tour the exhibition as much as I can. Um, there is one last guided tour at the library. It's on Monday at six o'clock. It runs for about an hour and 15 minutes or so, just depending on um, questions and you know how much time people want to take. After it leaves the library, it'll be going to air at the Grain Exchange to Inverness at Eden Court, um, to Dun Dunfermline at the Carnegie Library and uh, Galleries, and then potentially at Inverclyde. Um, I still haven't had a chance to reach out to people myself, so I've still got a lot of ideas about other places like I'd like for it to go. There, I'm also looking at, um, well, we are in the process of planning some events with, with Rowan and a, a painter, uh, Karen Strang, under the heading of Creative Covens. So there will be something for International Women's Day, um, something on the 4th of June, which, were, which was the day that the Witchcraft Act went into effect. And we'd like to try to get a, a National Day of Remembrance. Um, so that's kind of ho hoping that'll get that ball rolling. And then in August, there's a World Day Against Witch Hunts. And so we're hoping to have an event here um, somewhere, probably in Edinburgh or maybe North Berwick. And it'd be an international event, having people from uh, you know different countries, people talking about not only the histories, but also the current events and the things that are happening. Thank you. Speak to me. Uh, I think we're going to have questions. Am I right to to um to both of us after this? Good. Um, I get the uh, yeah. I can get give you a separate one. <laughs> Just so because if you're doing questions together later. Oh yeah, that's fine. So let's unmute that. Hopefully that one's picking you up. Yes, OK. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks to you for putting this together and thanks to Carolyn for being the star of the show and um, telling us about the dresses, which are also the star of the show. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming. It's a grim topic, but something that we need to think about. Um, and I thought I would just talk a little bit about three of the accused witches um, in Karen's show um, and to partly to talk about them as individuals. I'm not an expert on every single one of, uh, of, of her accused witches, um, but um, um, I, I thought I would pick those three partly because I have got something to say about them, but also because between them, you know, they 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 might sort of give us some kind of arc or some kind of pattern or you know, different view of how um, we see things. So um, I'd pick Giles Duncan, Margaret Barclay, Janet Cornford. And so um, Giles Duncan, first of all, um, she was a servant of um, David Seaton, Bailey of Trenent, probably young, probably unmarried because most servants were. Um, there's a lot, of course, that we don't know about these people um, as human beings. You know, they, they just appear fleetingly as a gift, which is they're in the spotlight for certain things. But you know, probably young, probably unmarried, best we can do. Um, and um, she seems to have done some healing, magical healing, um, as some accused witches um, were known to have done. I don't think this is what's driving the entire witch hunt, but it, you know, it doesn't help if you're known to have these uh, magical powers. But David Seaton in Trenent in East Lothian um, really has got what you might say are issues with certain people. 
and he thinks people are out to get him and he becomes convinced that witches are out to get him um, and he interrogates Giles Duncan in his own house under torture. Is that legal? Well, don't knock it at work because he got a confession, so it must have been OK. Um, yeah, so he, he interrogates her under torture in his own house um, and she confesses to witchcraft and starts to name other people that he's got grudges against. And the story starts to look as if it's a conspiracy and it starts to sort of spiral upwards into the idea that there might be a conspiracy not just against David Seaton. And a lot of the early confessions are about the witches against David Seaton and his goods and stories of, yeah, anyway, um, uh, uh, of attacks against him. But it starts to be attacks against the king. And higher up people start to list and one thing leads to another. Um, but um, Jill's, whether she's really the one that started it all, I don't know. She certainly started that aspect of it, or we should say David Seaton, you know, uh, it's his voice that we're hearing sometimes in her confessions. Uh, you know, whose voice you're hearing when you get the, the record of uh, an accused witch's confession, you know, she said this, you know, did in fact all she say was yes in, in answer to a question. Um, you know, did, did you do this, 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 this and this? Yes. Um, um, it's, it's very hard to to out or something in some sense, but these confessions are often a kind of negotiation between the interrogated person and the interrogator. But the interrogators are sincere. They want the truth and they think that torture is at last revealing the truth that the suspect wants to wants to hide. I mean, they know that torture can lead people to confess falsely, but if they get credible details, ah, oh, yeah, you see, only a guilty person would know that. And so it starts to look credible. I'm afraid I don't regard it as credible, but you know, we have to try and understand why it looks credible at the time. You know, there are times when you think, yeah, maybe you should have just taken a step back and go, just a minute. You know, uh, am, am I um, going a bit too far here? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not in the business of making excuses for these people, but as a historian, before you start condemning, you have to understand. Okay, if you condemn without understanding, then you are, um, yeah, missing out on an important step. So let's try and understand. So that's Jules Duncan, and she was uh, eventually burnt at the stake, as were a, a number of the other people that she named. Uh, Margaret Barclay, um, she was the mm. wife of a Burgess in Irvine, small coastal town on the west of Scotland, um, the coastal trading town. And um, uh, we don't know much about her apart from the fact that she was married to, uh, was it uh, Archibald Dean, I think was her husband. Um, but she had a furious row with her brother-in-law, John Dean, because um, John Dean accused her of stealing some of his stuff. Now, the truth or otherwise of this, we'll never know. Um, but he said she had stolen some stuff. She said, no, she was innocent. This was wicked slander. Um, and um, the argument rumbled on. Uh, but at one point, John, well, John Dean was the skipper of a ship. And this ship was um, getting ready to um, sail off to France. And Margaret Barclay, because she was so furious with John Dean, came down to the quayside, and everyone is um, around the ship, um, um, getting it ready to sail. And she calls him out publicly, tells him uh, how how wicked he's been for um, for slandering her, and then she goes down on her knees and prays to God in public. Now, this is righteous indignation as far as she's concerned. And she prays to God that neither the sea nor salt water should carry him and that the crabs should eat him at the bottom of the sea because of the slander that he has committed to her good name. And the ship then sails off to France, but they never got there. The ship was wrecked on the coast of Cornwall. Six men, including John Dean, were trapped. When the survivors came back to Irvine, they didn't say, oh yeah, righteous indignation. Yeah, and clearly, you know, God will punish sinners such as John Dean, which is what Margaret Buckley thought. No, um, they thought it was her fault. 
and they thought it was witchcraft. So what we see here is community witchcraft and the idea of witchcraft being constructed from quarrels, curses, denunciations. Margaret Barclay didn't think that she was a witch. She was the one who was in the right room. He was in the wrong. But it was her anyway, but that's what she seems to sincerely to have thought. And she was invoking God and God's wrath, which could be considered to be an orthodox Christian idea. However, if you perceive that something bad has happened to you um, and you've had a quarrel with somebody, then you could think, yeah, it's that person's witchcraft, particularly if it's a woman, because people fear women's curses in the way that they don't fear men's curses. OK, um, moving quickly on, um, Janet Cornford also lived in a coastal town in Bittenweem in Fife, across the first few north from here. And um, she was much later. Oh, did I give the date for Margaret Barclay? 1617. So, and Jill um, uh, Duncan, she was executed in 1591. Historians should give dates, shouldn't we? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, Janet Confort, 1704, a witchcraft act is still in force. There are still some exceptions, but not very many. And uh, the, there's, there's definitely uh, a, a decline. But um, in 1704, there is a local panic over witchcraft in the small town of Pitt and Wien, um, when a 16 year old blacksmith's apprentice, Patrick Morton, um, starts to behave oddly, starts to have what are described as fits. Um, you know, what's going on here? Uh, it's not entirely clear, but there's some kind of psychosis that I'm not really prepared to diagnose retrospectively after 300 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, but the the minister of the town, Patrick Cooper, um, who's a leading sort of veteran um, Presbyterian campaigner, um, um, thinks this is important, and he thinks that this is a case of demonic possession. And so, you know, demons are causing him to behave oddly, and that the demons have been sent by a witch, or which is plural. And one of the things he does is that he reads to Patrick Morton. Um, um, a previously printed account that had been printed in 1698 of a previous bewitchment by demonic possession that, that describes um, the symptoms of demonic possession. So in effect, he's coaching Patrick Morton as to how to be a demoniac. Now, he probably doesn't think that he's setting the whole thing up. He's probably sincere. He's, you know, um, but... Yeah, um, um, you know, even at the time, this was said to be a bit iffy, and this did lead to controversy and recriminations, as we'll see. Um, but initially, you know, Patrick Morton does start naming various names of various people, and half a dozen people are um, arrested, imprisoned, including Janet Cornfield. We'll come back to her in a minute. She's not one of the ones who is in the spotlight. There are two or three others who are in the spotlight early on. Um, and one of them is a man, Thomas Brown, who actually dies in prison, allegedly of starvation. Perhaps we should remember that there are some men and actually, you know, um, dying in prison of starvation might not be much fun. Uh, but um, the, um, the, in, the interrogators, including the minister and the, um, the local um, um, civic administrators of the town, they think they've got a case against these witches. They get them to confess a certain amount of ill treatment, possibly torture. Um, and certainly um, Janet Cornford is said to have been beaten by the minister himself, by his, his staff, to get her to confess. Um, and they then go to the central authorities in Edinburgh to try and get authority to have a criminal trial to, uh, to prosecute them for witchcraft. <coughs> but doubts start to arise. Um, there seems to be another faction in the town that is against this, and they they get to the um, suspects in prison at some point. Details of this are a bit obscure, um, but they get them to retract their confessions. And by the time the story gets to Edinburgh, it's not simply a story of, ah, oh, this is a bewitchment, we've got these confessions, it's all a, a, um, a, a cut and dried case. It, it's 
you know, questionable behaviour by this rather suspect 16-year-old guy and quite possible miscarriage of justice, maybe a bit of insanity going on and this doesn't look like witchcraft and the central authorities go, no, this will not fly. We're not having any criminal prosecutions. What happened after that? Details obscure, but um, Janet Cornfoot escaped. Well, let's now bring the focus onto her. Um, she escaped from prison and um, was later a arrested elsewhere in Fife and brought back to the town. This is probably, they probably don't intend to prosecute her, they, uh, but um, you know, what exactly is going on is not entirely clear. Um, but she is already some kind of outcast. She tries to get lodgings with one of the other accused witches, but a crowd grabs her that day. And they, they start to beat her up and they take her to the shore. They start to ill-treat her. They tie her to a rope that's stretched between a ship and the shore uh, and they throw stones at her. They drag her up and down. And um, finally, they lay her down, put a door on top of her and pile stones on top of it until she until she dies. And um, that method of killing, you know, piling stones on top, seems to me it's sort of a symbolic that it, this, is a, this is a group effort. Everyone can go away thinking, well, it might not have been my stone. But, you know, they're, they're collectively killing her. So very unusually, what we've got is lynching by a crowd. And it's the only one recorded in, in, um, uh, in, the, in, in the entire Scottish witch hunt. Probably about 2,500 executions. They're all, you know, legal executions as a result of trials by formally constituted criminal courts. But with Janet Cornfoot, we see a crowd that, you know, uh, wants to, um, to get the witch, and they're cross that the authorities won't execute um, an, an alleged witch. There are recriminations afterwards, which I, I don't want to go into, but you can sort of see an arc that the central authorities, first of all, get more excited about witchcraft, more worried about witchcraft, more worried about the devil, um, and, and this then leads to, um, you know, various panics, prosecutions for several decades. By 1704, people are starting to have doubts. It's more divisive, um, but some people at the grassroots still want to do this. I'm sure there's lots more I could say, but I think I'll stop there and uh, I'd be um, pleased to have questions. And um, I'm sure Carolyn would like to have questions from about her. Just while you think of the questions, uh, I'll just sort of mention sort of like uh, Julian's book, Scottish Witch Hunt in Context, is behind Ruby's head there. And just to highlight that not, he's both of the have highlighted the stories behind and the, the gruesome details, and not, ever, not everything is online. And part of what we're wanting to do is to make sure that people know these stories. And uh, we're going to try and make sure that those 13 women are represented on Wikipedia by the end of the afternoon with brownies and millionaire shortcake uh, mm -hmm. and T-shirts and uh, stickers and tote bags over there. And there's an the array of witchy books, witchcraft related books on the shelf there as well. So that that's coming up after these talks. And also, uh, is that going to move on or is it died? Yeah, is, this is what Wikipedia looked like about six years ago, September 2017. There's a template there called Magic and Witchcraft in the British Isles that had about three accused witches from Scotland on it. That was six years ago. Alison Balfour was one. Isabel Gowdy, of course. Uh, she's probably more, one of the most, more famous accused witches in Scotland and Elspeth Reoc. There was those were the only three in that template box six years ago. And it's now got, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I can't count that quickly, but it's got like it looks like another 20 or 30 in there. I, I wrote the page about Gillis Duncan, Giles Duncan. So if there's anything wrong or missing, it's my fault or incorrect, but you can fix it. Yeah. And also we have and the pronunciation you and you start you occasionally see it spelled J E E L S. Uh, it is a tricky name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
that uh, Wikipedia doesn't usually have pronunciation. But sometimes it does. You could do, you could put it in if you want. Yeah, we can we can do that. <laughs> and Anna's in the room as well. She's on our Edinburgh Award. And she just recently wrote a page about John Kincaid, the, who was a witch pricker from Trenent in East Lothian. That was just created just a few days ago. So there's little impactful things we can do to raise these stories in the public consciousness. So without more ado, do we have any questions for our speakers? Uh, I think we'll go to this lady first and then you. OK, so. Me? Yeah. yeah. OK, um, yeah. So I just have a question about um, I was just thinking about the marital status of these women. Was there any level of protection that came with it? Like I was just thinking, because you've mentioned, for example, how Margaret Markley was married to an Archibald. So I was thinking, was there, or not necessarily in that case, because we, you said the story and how it ended, but just wondering about that. Perhaps. Yeah, should I take that one? Yeah. Um, usually, if, if a married woman is accused, um, as far as we can tell, usually her husband rallies around to support her. Um, I think in Margaret Barclay's case, uh, her husband doesn't try very hard. Um, and the, the, there is um, the, the pamphlet account that, that we know most of her uh, about, um, it, you know, has him rocking up to the court and she says, you have been over late in coming. But of course, you know, uh, you have to think about his position because she's alleged to have killed his brother. So that, that may be unusual. Um, marital status more broadly, uh, um, um, we don't know much about many of these um, people's marital status. It only gets recorded in the documents sporadically. I think they're more likely to write down um, the fact that a woman has a living husband. Mm. You know, if, if she is unmarried, they're not necessarily going to say unmarried. And if she's a widow, they're not necessarily going to say, and she's a widow. Occasionally you do see it, but more often they're just, you know, it's just not interesting, it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a living husband has to be written down because he's probably going to be knocking on the door, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he appears in the narrative somehow or other. So so the statistics in the database vastly overstate the number of, who are married because they are not typical. Mm. Um, but um, the... There is probably, and you know, this is related to age. Widows tend to be older. Uh, the, the, you know, the widows probably there are probably more widows executed for witchcraft than would be um, in the population as a whole. But you know, the statistics are not very crunchy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Under the various witchcraft acts in Europe, something like twenty percent of the prosecutions and executions were of warlocks. Has any work been done on the matter of uh, warlocks in this um, exercise? Uh, yes, there has. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I tend to use the word witch both for men and women, but you do sometimes see the men being called warlock as well as witch. Um, yeah, you're right. It's uh, I think the figures in Scotland are about 15% men, 20% in Europe as a whole, from what we can tell. Again, the figures are not very crunchable. Um, and there has been some work about it. Uh, and, and I wrote a paper with, um, uh, um, some years ago um, called Men and the Witch Hunt in Scotland, um, which was published in a book edited by Alison Rowlands. Think called something like witchcraft and masculinities in uh, modern Europe. So, so yeah, just refer you to uh, um, to, to that book. I'm um, just brief summary. Um, the um, the the men who tend to appear um, the the um, they're less likely to just come up when people are, are saying, and who else was there when you met the devil? Women tend to name other women. And there seems to be an assumption that witches are more likely to be female, but there's no rule that says they have to be. Um, and you seem to have an overrepresentation either of people who are magical practitioners because they can be men as well as women. So they're quite, I'm never surprised when an, a male accused witch turns out to have been doing some kind of magical practice or their kind of collateral damage. A woman is accused and then her husband or, you know, he's related to this um, the, this previous woman who has been in the spotlight. So the, those those are the main um, uh, uh, um, ways in which men can get into it. Should we have some questions for Karen? Were there any lesser offences 
under the Witchcraft Act that didn't result well, the witchcraft in, act in, in execution. No. The Witchcraft Act itself simply said witchcraft is a crime and should be executed. Um, it, it's only 200 words, and staring closely at those words won't tell you very much. Um, but the, the, the court sessions and the church courts are interested in superstitious magic and what they sometimes call charming. Uh, that's not a capital offence. You know, you'll be made to do penance before the congregation for charming. And, you know, is this person a charmer or is this person a witch? You can sometimes see people being constructed in one way or the other. So, yes, the, 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 there is a sort of penumbra of other lesser, um, you know, religious offences that are not secular criminal offences. That's helpful. And did uh, redemption play any part? Oh, yeah. The, you know, the Kirk Session is interested in, uh, in rehabilitation, penance and redemption. Yeah, that's what they want to do. Yeah. Um, I'm just coming from a lecture, so I was late at, so I'm sorry if like, it's something that there's comments that I'm missing. But uh, in this time, like, how well defined was the border between, like, sort of, like, folk medicine and healing and things that would be perceived? And uh, you just made the distinction between charming and witch witchcraft. Like, how, like, what defined a particular practice as witchcraft or as related to the devil or, or malicious in some way as distinct from, like, if I just have some herbs and I give them to you and you're sick, what makes that, like, a Potion or something. I mean, I, 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 I think that's a question. I'm going to be for Karen. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the, the church is interested in whether this is superstitious and, you know, magical or what, as one might say, preternatural or supernatural. And, you know, if we got much longer, I could unpack those terms further. But, you know, uh, is there something spiritual involved in this or is this is this natural or not natural? So the herbs probably OK, you know, but that, you know, that's that's probably natural. If it looks as though you invoke spirits in some way, then they will go, you know, is this good spirits or bad spirits? And it's probably not good spirits because good spirits probably wouldn't do that. The um, people who are sick. <laughs> no, no, they no. Uh, it, 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 well, you know, it depends on you know um, on um, on how the story gets told. Uh, you know, if if this is simply a prayer, that's okay. Um, you know, if this if this is invocation of fairies, that's something I think because fairies, you know, it's probably a demon. You know, you know, the, um, the, these the, these educated people they don't believe in fairies, but they do believe in demons. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so, so they're trying to draw a line as to whether, um, you know, supernatural or demonic powers were invoked in your healing. So, so it's not so much did you do good or bad. I mean, the the common folk are more interested in did you do good or bad. Did you uh, observe, uh, you know, a sort of ethical code of practice? Um, and if you did good, you know, that's fine. You know, even if you did invoke fairies or whatever. Um, but the yeah the. By, by the time it gets to the church courts and the elites, yeah, it's, you know, are, are there bad spirits involved? And where that interface, you know, there's, there's a lot of research and historical discussion gets uh, go, goes on around, you know, in, you know, how are they deciding, you know, what, you know, when you've got these people, the elders of the Kirk session, how well educated are they? You know, are they also thinking about fairies? Anyway, yeah, I think that's uh, that's enough. But that's the line that that that, that they're trying sometimes um, rather desperately to draw. Yeah, I have a question to Karen. Um, just um, so, do you think personally, um, when talking about, for example, Margaret Barclay's story? Uh, do you think it would have gone differently if it was a man that said all those things? And just on the example of like witches in general, like about, because you were mentioning about how, um, I mean, obviously it's like, we were talking here about witches, but there's warlocks, but what do you think that like, so could have like just a man said these things exactly worked toward in the same manner and got away with it? I wouldn't imagine so. I mean, it's, it's I think it's kind of like, I'm not sure that I can predict that. It would probably be the other person, but um, yes, is my short answer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, people don't fear men's curses. All right. <laughs> so it was because she was a woman that made it more. Yeah. Because then they would have said that it was, as you said, not that uh, the man has put a curse on the ship, but it was. You know. mm. Yeah. Sure. Uh, hey. Wonderful exhibition. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You've got all the information sheets about them.
this guy here and, and his accomplices have produced all these Wikipedia articles. Did you use Wikipedia when you were doing when you were putting together those sheets? I'll be honest and say I didn't. Um, oh, I, nice. I, yeah, I used I, I used the um, the survey as a really good sort of starting point, but I looked at you know Julian's published work. I looked at a lot of other things that have been published. You know, um, there's Christine Marner. There's all sorts of stuff that. Um, it was just sort of more my go to. Um, yeah. Right, it's fair to say that probably Wikipedia cites some of these things, so Wikipedia yeah, might yeah. guide you towards these things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah. But I think I think the way that the the the, the database is laid out too, it made it made it all so much more accessible mm -hmm. and easy to to see the spread of things and where people went. It just um, it just worked better for my research. Thank you. Are there people who, I think this could be a question for either, do you know if there were people who would use the fear that people had about witches, like, in order to get rid of people who they just did not like, and if there was no, like, basis, like what you've described about actions that people really did take, do you know if there was anything like that? I'll take that one, yeah. Um, this is certainly not the main spring of what is driving the European or Scottish witch hunts. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, the, and the idea that somebody wakes up in the morning and thinks, aha, I do not like this person, I do not believe they are a witch, and perhaps I don't even believe in witchcraft, but I find it expedient to call them a witch, and therefore that's what I'm going to do. You know, even in its own terms, that only works if everybody else believes in witchcraft. So why would you yourself not believe in it? Nobody doesn't believe in witchcraft in this period. Everybody believes in it. There's, there's a discussion about perhaps what it means. I would love to be a fly on the wall in an early modern alehouse when people are talking about what witchcraft means. Um, but, um, uh, you know, people aren't, aren't thinking, you know, aha, you know, I am going to accuse someone falsely. Um, it's very hard to get into the mind of someone like David Seaton. Uh, and uh, but the best I can do is to say that when Giles Duncan, if it was Giles and not Agnes Sampson, it, when Giles Duncan named Euphemia McCallion and another of the North Berwick witches, um, you know, a, a sort of light bulb went off in his head. Yeah, I hate that woman so much. <laughs> So it's really credible that she would be a witch, even if he hadn't thought that before. And it's even possible that he fed Jules the name. You know, could Euphemia McCallion be a witch? Could she be a witch, right? You're torture her a bit more. Could she be a witch? But I doubt if he is saying to himself, of course, I know she's not a witch, but I'm going to get her accused anyway. You know, that's the kind of thing that wicked people that you hate would be. So, you know, you, there's a sort of feedback mechanism whereby the people that you hate would be rich. Uh, it, this is very tricky. I mean, you know, you know, early modern Europe contains criminals, it contains dishonest people. Uh, um, and it is quite possible, you know, I can't disprove the idea that Seaton said to himself, of course, I know she's not a witch, but it seems to me to accuse her. But you know, I, I've, I've never been able to find a case where you can really nail that. Um, but I'm very grateful for your question because it's, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a question that puts a historian on the spot. I think we're going to have to sort of move on to the yeah. movie sport. But is, has anyone got a question that they would be deeply hurt and upset if that they didn't ask before they went? Ish, yes. It's a yes and no one. Do you feel that by your work in the exhibition, the voices of those, those women are now drowning out some of the voices that use them? I would love to think so, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure that they are. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I'm trying to do what I can to give them just. Just a moment, which is all I can really offer. Uh, yeah. yeah. I want to listen to David Seaton's voice too. Mm. Mm. Not because I necessarily like him, 
but we need to understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a really short question in my distribution. Okay, so Ruby, do you want to get set up and we'll put it like so that yeah, you, and you, then you, go you up while you're getting set up, you can ask it. It might be a bit of a stupid question, but Mike Rosie got um I don't remember the search, I think it's the surname, but it was Janet you were talking about. How she escaped from prison. Janet Comfort. Yes. So my question is, how do we know once she escaped prison that that was actually her? I'm a bit stupid, but I'm just wondering how do they know, or like what kind of records are there? Uh, there were three pamphlets published about the lynching. Mm -hmm. um, the, there were few that were published within weeks or days denouncing um, the, um, the, 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 this, this wicked act and describing it in detail but, um, and naming her. And you know, she is in the, the, the documents beforehand. Um, and then there was uh, a further pamphlet published, almost certainly written by Patrick Cooper, the minister, um, trying to defend himself and everybody else. And, and, uh, and he doesn't actually um, try to justify the, the, the lynching, but he says, well, it, you know, uh, it, it wasn't us, it was strangers, etc. He actually admits in that pamphlet that two of his servants were in the crowd. But they left early, that's all right. <laughs> no, I, I, do I believe that? No, I don't. But, uh, but um, yeah, the, the fact that you've got three pamphlets from different sides, you know, try, trying to argue the case and, the, 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 and they all agree on the name. Yeah, um, see how they know like it was her when they found her and they were like, that's her. She escaped from prison. Yeah, I think they can recognize. Oh, okay. So they're, okay. Yeah, yeah, she was. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's all. Thank you. Thanks to both our speakers. So give a round of applause. And then we'll move on to our final talk. Who's Ruby? Should, should we just move, let's move these chairs so that we can have a good look at Ruby's slides because she's just uh, it's been lovely. Maybe you can see them as well. That way. There we go. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Ruby and I'm a student at the University of Edinburgh, currently studying computer science, but I've been doing an internship that I did all summer and I'm now doing one day a week um, called Witch Finder General Data Visualisation. So I'm working on this project, the map of the Cuban witches in Scotland. Um, so I'll just tell you a bit about the project. So Professor Julian Goodyear and um, three other historians in the early 2000s created the survey of Scottish witchcraft which we've heard about um, so far, um, which is a database which collects all the information of all the accused witches in Scotland between the years 1563 and 1736. So it has information on over 3,000 accused witches and it has so much information with over 300 fields across um, 30 databases. So it's a really valuable resource that um, so many people use. Like when you talk about anyone that kind of, I just like put together exhibitions, write books, um, I've talked to people that have podcasts and witches as well. They all like they all use this resource so much. Um, so it's so important. Um, so then um hearing the working media students and residents and students then data science um, from SAIN. And they uploaded all this data onto Wikidata, which is a sister project to Wikipedia, and um, which is open linked data, which is machine readable. Um, so once this was all uploaded onto Wikidata, it makes it really easy to visualise with and it became apparent that like, you could make something a more kind of interactive and engaging way, engaging way to present this data um, by finding the coordinates of the locations where these witches resided. So this is the website here, so that's the link if you want to look at it. I don't know if you've looked at it before. Um, so like, it's an interactive map, you can zoom in and then what kind of these witches appear and you can click on them, read their more information about them, their names and um, where they lived and lots of other information. So um, this project started in 2019 when uh, Emma Carroll, who's a geography student at the uni as well, um, worked on locating all the residents of the witches, of the case witches. Um, so, Obviously, this was centuries ago, so a lot of the place names have changed. So it wasn't just a simple task of like looking up the place names and finding them. She had to look through lots of historical maps, place name records, gazettes, and um, historical records to try find where these places were, and then find the coordinates. And then she uploaded these to Wikidata, which then allowed the data to be queried and then put on the map that we can see here. 
um, with their residents. And this was supported by Richard Lawson, who basically created the website, um, and he's supported all the interns since as well, from June 2019 to October 2023, where he like sadly passed away suddenly. Um, but he really has been so such a huge part of this project, creating the website, and was such so generous with time and supporting me and the other interns um, that have worked on this project. So yeah, Emma Carroll did the kind of main start by the work in finding all the locations, which is the basis of the project. But then other interns, including me, have worked on it since. So Maggie Lynn um, added a lot more information to the wiki data and putting information about the trials and investigations. And she worked along with Joseph, um, who was the open source um, developer who embedded all her websites and made the website more usable and accessible as well and improved the interface. Then Claire Panel at the start of this year worked one day of a week and she created like a process for quality assuring the data. So as the data has been uploaded to Wikidata, like Wikipedia, Wikidata can be edited by anyone. So this is really important because it doesn't mean that data can be updated um, to like become more accurate, but also means things can change. So Claire um, created the process of reading in the data from the survey and wiki data to compare it so we can see where the changes have been made and check that they're um, historically accurate. And um, Julian helped with this also um, as we go on to editing regularly. Um, for its expertise. So I and started and summer continued the quality assurance work, but I've also been working um, on this new updated version of the website, which Maggie, so Maggie's visualizations um, aren't on the current version of the website yet. So I've been working on trying to get that ready so that all these new visualizations and features um, can be released into version two of the website um, and adding some new features myself. So I'll show you what kind of some of the new things on the website are. So it has a new interface before the filters now on the side, it's got more spaced out and and this, yeah, it's just kind of improved how you did this up. Um, and then there's some new features as well. So there's now a timeline. You can either um, select panic periods or non panic periods. So they're preset time sets, or you can customize it yourself. And this kind of allows you to see how um, the spread of the witch, like the accusations throughout the years. Um, so it's a kind of new, interesting way to explore. The period and then um, there's also a new page which is a historypedia timeline search and uh, where the accused witches appear in order of their um, trials and then you can click on these and then it can show you the links to survey but also the wikipedia pages and the wikipedia pages are a good way to like share the individual stories and get more of the kind of details like it can it, just emphasizes kind of actually how horrifying find lots of the individual stories work. And um, because we're looking at the math stuff, you see them all, but like reading the individual stories is often where like you kind of learn how horrific it was. And then here you can search by name as well, filtered by gender, age, um, and things like that as well. Then there is with the data that Maggie uploaded to Wikidata as well, you can now filter with this on the website as well. Before it was just gender occupation and social class. Now we have new ones, case characteristics, pack the devil, property damage, meeting places and meeting information. Um, so here's an example, that's the different packs with the devil. So you can see all the different and learn a lot more about what these women and men were accused of. And then there's some other new features. This is a trial mentions network graph and you can explore like who mentioned who in the trials and see how it spread through um, years. And then there's a historic map here, pictures so we can see it um, presented on a map, which is closer to the time of the accusations and um, with more similar place names. And then a contact form as well, because obviously we've not got all the information right as the place names. So we've had been contacted by quite a few people being like, we actually think they lived here. And um, so this allows us to constantly of the website, but it's also you get lots of positive feedback. Like the, the site's been visited by like hundreds of thousands of people, so it's nice hearing about the people that enjoy using it as well. Um, 
And then we're also, there's some new things we're going to currently add before we release version two, like a map and memorials, because lots of local communities have kind of um, created things to try honour and remember the women that were killed. And um, so it's kind of a nice way to share what lots of communities have done and um, let people like know, let them know what's nearby to them and stuff, because it's something that's a lot of interest to people right now. Well, that's me. Anyone have any questions on me? Can I just ask you? So, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the map itself, when you click on the like individual witches, um, yeah, I'll give it. Okay, so, and then like, if you so for them, some of them it has like more information about like the trials. And, yeah. So if there's no more information, doesn't mean that there is just no records of. Yeah, when there's no more information, it's like the records one. Yeah. Then some of the which the accused which is like nothing was reported about them. Also, so how do you know about them? Um, because there were still like the trials. Uh, Julian probably felt this mm. better to answer this, but the trials were recorded, but just not information about oh. them. So like some of them, their names weren't even recorded. It was just like three women, like so that's like it was so impersonal. Sometimes. Do they say like three women from somewhere? Or yeah. More? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just just to focus, just to add, add a little bit to that. Um, probably the largest single number of, of all those, which is what we know about them, is we've got a central record of an order to hold a trial. Mm. And so, um, so a trial should be held of this named person, or sometimes you get a list of names, um, and there'll be a place and there'll be a date. Was that trial held? Uh. Probably. You know, we don't have a record of the actual trial. Were they convicted? Probably, but again, we're not sure. Uh, so the, there's um, a, a lot of stuff that we don't know. But uh, um, but the reason we can do that is because we've got that central register that gives us names, places, dates. But it's not always um, complete because, as Ruby says, sometimes you know, the, the, you know, we, we just got three witches. There's quite a lot of you know um, unknown number. Do you have for some of the witches? Is there like no name? Yeah, there is some, like no name tags or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, sometimes it's just got a, a group of, uh, 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 we don't know how many there were. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, and so, so the overall statistics are, mm. you know, imprecise. Yeah. So we, we've added records to Histropedia about all the un, unknown. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Or then the sometimes there's like three witches. That's all that's that that was recorded in the survey. Three unknown witches, or Thank you. I think the the, yeah, yeah. the play crit recently sort of uh, was not very. They they were sort of inspired because there was an entry in the survey I think about that said sundry witches. Yeah, and they 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 sort of like well let's let's they were people. You know the word sundry is you know you know not a fitting memorial to them in some way so yeah we've tried to add the unnamed cases as well and it's probably going to be a quite a technical question for the review so you've got you're pulling in data from lots of different sources so wiki data uh, you said about the the memorials is that in an existing data set or was it a distinct data set no, we're having to research. We're researching that currently and uploading into Wikidata, yeah. so we'll pull that from Wikidata. Um, you're using OpenStreetMap as your base layer there. Yeah. Are you getting any data from OpenStreetMap on memorials? Um, no, well, we're not using that currently. No. I'll email you after. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're sort of like reaching out to people as well. They're, they're sort of, they've been emailing me and uh, DMing me on Twitter with images that they've taken of a local memorial to them and there's yeah. you know more recent memorials coming up all the time like one in Peebles and one in Mid Calder recently as well um, and we're, we're just trying to sort of like make sure that we we have a record of them and to, to make people aware of them and so that we have a map for places to visit. I'm also liaising with Julian about a 23 stop walking tour of Edinburgh about places in Edinburgh that have connections with the accusers or the Lord Advocates or, uh, or you know, but also the accused themselves. 
I'll email you both. Yeah. We're trying to sort of like do just do justice in, in all these ways, these, these different ways. Um, I just think it's amazing that all this work is coming together and it's great to see it. I was wondering about the exhibition, which I think is amazing, showing the detail of the words that are used and the challenging uh, situations that these women mainly found themselves in. And I just wondered, how does that feeling of, you know, being accused and all these horrible things said about them or, or confessed to, how is that going to feed into this archive so that when the exhibition's toured round and round and hopefully gets a permanent home, that, that there's a link between the two. I don't know if that's planned or something yeah, would be to nice happen. If we could include. Well, we're going to add like a further reading page, mm -hmm. but it would be nice also to include the kind of other things that people can go see in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Honor yeah. and let me get yeah. Yeah, so I have a question actually. You were just also on the page itself and you were talking there was like a panic period and non panic yeah. period. What is that? <laughs> I'm really prepared. Yeah, I'll be sorry. I don't know. Um, the, the, the timeline or the number of accusations um, goes sort of like this. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, you suddenly see huge jumps in numbers of accusations um, and um, that's when they're, they're most intense and nobody's ever really run the numbers and the numbers are not very crunchable but you know the five biggest panics may well have been more than half of all the, the, the witches and altogether they would only come to um, sort of five or six years out of the you know um, 170 odd that the witchcraft act was in force so um, yeah, those panic periods look very different from the ones the panic periods. But those are sort of national panics. You also sometimes get local panics that um, that don't necessarily make such a blip on the national figures, or or you get panics that don't necessarily lead to any executions, like the one in Pitt and Ween. No one was executed. Somebody died in prison. There's still a local panic. Is there like a reason for these periods occurring, like historical reasons, or I don't know, some diseases? I don't know, spreading or something or um, several of them you can link to the establishment of a new regime. Mm. Um, but that's not the you know the the trouble with witchcraft is that if you start producing one explanation, it, it doesn't never fits all of them. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, the, the, um, I haven't got time to go into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, so is there any kind of measure of quality of the data you receive like do you have like an individual kind of score for you know lower quality evidence higher quality evidence or not necessarily i mean we're using the data from the survey primarily from so it's like but oh, high quality. It's all... <laughs> not if it's missing yeah it's, yeah we, there's just stuff yeah. that we don't know yeah okay. hey i think uh we are over time and i i need to sort of like I've got 10 minutes to sort of change into Wikipedia mode. So if anyone would like to ask any final questions that they are really, you know, it's going to burn a hole in them if they don't ask, then we'll make this the last question and we'll just thank our guests a lot as well. But if anyone, anyone got one final last question or thought? Yeah, Kayla? Yeah, thank you. I just want to have a question for uh, all our speakers. Because uh, I get to know that like switch hand is in the background of like climate change and some political confliction, religious confliction. So we do those of things to memory of that period. So um, do give me some advice on how to like because nowadays there are many uh there will be like a similar climate change. From colder to warmer, like also some geopolitical confliction. Mm, to this like crisis lead to also uh, events like witch hunting. So, do you have any like uh, advice or reflection from previous um, stories, like to um, inform people nowadays to how to tackle with such? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm, not sure, so I, so I'm not sure I understand your question, but um, it, uh, it's it's either about it's 
is historical witch hunting linked to historical climate change? Or is this something about present day climate change and human response to it? Uh, yes. Which of those two? Um, uh, uh, the previous witch hunting linked to climate change and other like... Right, okay. So, the, the, so this is the idea that witch hunting in the past was linked to past climate change. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, on the whole, um, um, you ask different scholars, you'll get different answers, in particular if you ask Wolfgang Beringer in Germany, he will tell you that past climate change was important. Um, I don't think it's a general explanation for um, uh, European witch hunts. Well, um, the, the idea, for what it's worth, the, the idea is that the early modern period, and in particular the late 16th, early 17th century, is what's called the Little Ice Age. It's much colder than it is now. And um, there the certainly are episodes with frost and storms that are alleged to be um, linked to um, witches uh, and that demand for, for punishment of the witches for um, destroying the grape harvest in the Rhineland, for example, um, is, is what's driving this. And yeah, it sort of works for some of the cases in the Rhineland. Um, but as a general explanation for the witch hunt in early modern Europe, um, it's it's fairly far down my list of explanations, I'm afraid. Um, so um, uh, it, 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 it can't entirely be ignored, but I, I can't really see it in Scotland. I can't I, I can't see uh, the Little Ice Age leading to anything specific that you can then say, and this led to witchcraft accusations. Maybe there, there more research could be done on this. There's a lot that we don't know about early modern Scottish climate, but yeah, that's a, that, that'll be another um, session, I think. So I think we'll have to draw time at that point. We could talk forever about this, and I would love to um, organise a proper full day or half day symposium about Scottish accused witches next year, where we could probably launch our website once it's like finally ready to go, which shouldn't be too much longer. Uh, but there's lots of what we do want to achieve. So but I'm hoping we can organize something in the in 2024 and uh, that would work with Carolyn and Julian's schedules and Ruby's schedules as well and invite other speakers to have a real sort of deep delve. But this was just a, a little taster. Um, so can we just thank all our guests? Great, you're more than welcome to stay if you're interested in Wikipedia editing, uh, and I'm sure if, if Carolyn and Julian might be willing to sort of like take any final last questions personally, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.